Fifth Hour Radio Show. So, boss, give us a rundown on how you first got into MMA. Were you what you considered a natural fighter? Had you found yourself getting into a lot of scuffles as a kid? You know, what got you into the more scientific approach to the sport? You know, for me, it was all new. I, I was training in Holland. I, I lost a, a tie box, two tie boxing matches, my last two. And uh, I, I should have never fought those. I, one I took when I was drunk on a, on Christmas Eve, uh, on, on New Year's Eve. Apparently, I said yes to a guy who was going to come out of prison and start, restart his career. The Animal. That was actually his nickname, uh, uh, Frank the Animal Lopman. It's like... 52 fights with 48 knockouts. And I go, sure, I'll fight him. But I didn't I had, didn't train for four years. And uh, they called me in February. They said, hey, where do we send the posters to? I said, well, well posters. Yeah, from the fight. I said, what fight are you talking about? Your fight. I said, I'm fighting. <laughs> and they said, yeah, in uh, three weeks. <laughs> I go, oh, shit. Now, I've been a bouncer. You know, you close at 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, some guys, we still go out after that. So the health. Not a really healthy lifestyle for four years. So I thought, I said, you know what, I'll try it. But I should have, uh, of course, ran out of gas. I got really tired. I lost the fight. Anyway, uh, I headed to a tie boxing because everybody told me, oh, you see, I always told you he couldn't fight. I forgot about my first 40 knockouts. And uh, suddenly I was, uh, I was not good anymore. So I still wanted to do martial arts. And one thing that we did, we did these crazy shows, martial arts shows. Like on a high level, we do our music, we put a lot of comedy routines in there, and people really liked it, you know, and, and we start doing it in nightclubs, and then we start doing it on big shows, and suddenly TV came to us, we got Dutch TV, we started, went through Europe, we went to Bercy in France, and it was really a lot of athletic stuff we would do, you know, we would come up with a cartwheel, a backflip, and then a somersault, that's the way we would walk up to the ring, and... um and on one of these shows, there was a, a guy, Chris Dolman, and he, he was from the organization of Rings in Japan. And he said, dude, you got some crazy abilities. and all the things that you do. Maybe you should think about free fighting. That's what they called it in the beginning. And uh, I said, sure. I start training there, got my butt handed to me the first time. and uh, But that was it. I, I really wanted to do it. And then, you know, I got an injury here, injury there. Suddenly he called me. He said, dude, jump in the car. Because there's two Japanese guys here in Amsterdam, they're looking for new fighters. So I took the one and a half hour drive over to Amsterdam. I got in a big brawl there with one of the champions from Rings because they were filming, and then he tried to knock me out, so I knocked him out. And uh, that was it. That, you know, I saw them pointing at me, and I think two months later I was fighting in Japan. I had no no clue what the rules were. I mean, I thought there were weight classes. My opponent is suddenly 45 pounds heavier. I go, oh, and that's okay. Yeah, we have no weight classes. I go, okay. How many rounds we're fighting? He says, one round. I said, oh, that's great. How many minutes? 30. <laughs> I go, oh, yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> but that was pretty much it. I was the striker and with a little tiny bit of ground. And, and, and then I, you know, after my last one, I won my first by knockout. Then the second by knockout. Third one, he, they caught me in a toehold. I didn't even know what it was. I knew that it hurt a lot. You know, and uh, I go, oh, my God, I need to find somebody I can train with. Because Amsterdam, on a good time, is one and a half hour drive. But if you drive in the morning, it's going to take two hours. It takes four hours driving out of your day already. So, um, you know, I uh, I lost again. And then my last loss, I lost against uh, Ken Shamrock. And that really upset me because I, I thought, you know, everybody's going to beat me now because I don't know the ground game enough. And uh, that really sparked something in me. I found one training partner, Leon Van Dyke. He was a 19-year-old guy, super athlete, very freaking strong. And we just, with the two of us, we're watching fights, we're watching instructions, and we tried to make everything better. And, and it started escalating, like two, three times a day. We got nuts. I was post-its all over my house. I always tell people, this is a true story, I would wake up my wife in the middle of the night because I would dream of submission. I would put her in that submission. <laughs> I would write it down and then, uh, and, and then continue and use that the next day in training. I won my next eight fights all by submission. Suddenly, I flipped the whole thing around. And then, actually, submissions, you know, it became my bread and butter. I, I really loved it. If you look at my... Uh, at the end of my career, I won 14 fights by submission and 12 by knockout. So, you know, I started to catch up with the submission game. And uh, that, that was pretty much how I learned on the job, so to say. Now, did you did you ever find yourself nervous before a fight, you know, fighting in front of a large crowd? You know, sometimes comics, musicians have pre-performance jitters. Is it the same way for a fighter? Do you get those same kind of butterflies in your stomach? You know, yeah, I, 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 did, I did have that in... Um, 
in Holland with Thai boxing. Um, I couldn't really control myself. I was a great Thai boxer, but, you know, if it would go to a second round, because I used to throw so much, power, like 14 fights, I had 13 first round knockouts. You know, so, and one was in the second round, and I was, I was sick that day, so that's why. But, but I knew that 30 minutes, you know, I need to pace myself. So when I came to Japan, for some reason, the Japanese audience is so quiet, and everything is, you know, I, I, uh, I, I didn't have jitters at all. It was a really weird thing. I, ne I never had, the, I saw these, all the other guys, you know, the, the pressure points to make themselves relax, and I was just cracking jokes with everybody. I was always the guy in the bus who had the microphone and made everybody laugh on the way to the fight and the way back from the fight. You know, just having uh, fun. I really enjoyed fighting there. I don't know why that got away. When it, when it come time to actually go into the ring but before the match, was there anything that you used to psych yourself up with? No, I would always um, stay calm, stay calm. Uh, don't lose your cool. That was the only thing. I'm a hothead, you know, so if somebody hits me, I will, oh, dude, I want to destroy you. And, and, you know, with 30-minute fights, I had to stay calm. Like, my corner was my manager. I never had a corner. I taught everything myself. So my manager, if somebody would hit me, which didn't happen, thank God, there, but uh, he would say, stay calm, stay calm, relax, breathe, you know, because I really wanted to go in and, and, and finish the job. But realizing that if, if this guy is a really tough guy, and I, I, I tried to knock him out for the first three minutes, I got 27 minutes to go, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. So staying calm... Is for me the most important. I have kicked guys out of my dressing room who say, oh, yo, kick his head up, break his fucking eye. And I go, guys, don't talk like that. Out of the room. You know, I, I don't want that energy, the, the violent energy. I, uh, fighting has nothing to do with violence, and people don't realize it. Some fighters, they really need to get smacked in the face. But, I, you know, I think the guy who's calm and collected is always winning. Was, was there ever a fight where you were just angry, though? Just just couldn't keep it calm? Just they, they got to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, that was my um, uh, comeback. I had a comeback in um, in Pancras, and uh, Hicks and Gracie was actually sitting there ringside. Later, I took the microphone and I challenged him uh, because, you know, at that time, they were talking about Pancras, and I said, okay, so let's fight any rule, any time. But anyway, I did a fight for, uh, like, a year in Pancras, and they wanted me to fight this guy, and I was going to, that was in September. In October, I was going to fight Randy Couture at the time. That was set up. Mm -hmm. The there was a plan. So I said, listen, I cannot fight because I got ready to tour if I'm going to get injured. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to do the UFC. They said, no, don't worry about it. We, uh, the fighter is not as strong as the fighter and uh, no problem. So then I came over there and this guy is like an ex-rugby player in Japan. And then Guy Metzger tells me the day before, dude, I get so angry. He says, boss, you know that they specially trained this guy to beat you. Funaki trained this guy for two years and uh, to, 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 to beat you because I beat Funaki in my last fight before that. And that, you know, now I was angry. Now I was literally, because I was not going to hit and uh, going to kick, I, I was going to submit him. That was my plan, but I literally told my hands, I said, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I, I speak to myself. I said, you guys are going to get hurt tonight because I'm going to knock this guy out now. And that was, I lost my cool there. You can tell when you see the fight. I'm very emotional, way too over the top. You know, I knock him out in like two minutes or so. But I, I, it was, uh, I lost my cool a little bit. Like, that was the first time when he fell on the ground, I hit him, I hit his head back into the ground again. You know, the only other time that I did that was with Funaki, who uh, stood in front of me before the fight and with his tummy slit his throat. <laughs> that really made me angry as well. I go, okay. And my manager goes like, oh, God, stay calm. I said, oh, I stay calm. I said, but I'm going to mess this guy up now. No, you know, so. Do you ever get that? I mean, you're a legendary fighter. If you're out on the street, do you ever have anybody just come up and just challenge you, just start crap, man? You know, I had that in the past. I had to, after the whole Sweden story with the five bounces, I, I kind of never had that anymore. It's really weird. It's... um. Yeah, no, I, I think I projected, and I think also I'm, I'm really good with talking. I was a great bouncer, not because I could fight, because I would make the people not fight. Ten, nine out of ten times, when a fight breaks out, I, would, I didn't, even, didn't even have to throw a punch. I would simply explain them and say, guys, we're trying to have fun here. You want a beer? You want a beer? What is the trouble really about? You guys can't talk it out? They would literally talk it out in front of me. I would give them both a the beer, and it would be over. And that's what I do on the streets. 
you know, and I had these guys coming, you know, the big bodybuilder type, you know, with the tank tops, and I, but I just simply explained them. I said, guys, I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like a cocky guy, but you can't win. All the time that you spend on with, lifting weights, I'm training with professional other athletes. They're all fighters. You know, that's my job. You know, so chances you're going to win is very, very low. <laughs> you know, let's not do this. I don't even want to fight you. You know, why would we fight? It's a stupid thing. Kids fight. You know, once you start talking like that, then uh, they get it. And they, they realize it's like me shooting hoops. I always tell this friends, I'm going to challenge Kobe Bryant. You know, that's just shooting hoops. Now, guess who's going to win that game? You know, it's like, <laughs> really? You can challenge anybody, but that don't mean you're going to come out on top. That's that's it. You can challenge anybody, yeah. But, you know, I always tell them, like I said, you know, it's so useless. Fighting is so stupid. Like, for instance, if if a, if, if a guy looks at a girl, and oh, you look at my girl, I go, dude, you, you should be proud. <laughs> I mean, it's worse than when they look and they can look away and go, like, oh, my God, she's ugly. You know, <laughs> you, you have a beautiful girl. As long as she doesn't walk up to you or your girlfriend and starts talking and grabbing her, you know, there, there's no reason to fight. You should be a happy guy. Let's switch bases uh, for a second. I watched Here Comes the Boom a couple nights ago on DirecTV, and it was the first time I'd ever seen it. Now, don't, don't jump my case because I hadn't seen it yet because I got a two-year-old daughter, you know, and uh, when I'm watching TV, it's usually cartoons. Now, did you set out to be the star of that show? Because you really made the movie, man. You know, Kevin is, uh, is a good buddy of mine, and he really took care of me. I, had no, I never asked Kevin, uh, Kevin, I know him 16 years, I never asked him for a part because I know these actors, man, everybody's asking that. So I always stuck quiet, but I did a lot more other stuff. I did eight short episodes with his brother for Sony, which was a project for Sony also. This was also a Sony movie. I did The Kingdom of Ultimate Power, and, and Kevin really liked that character. You can find it online, Kingdom of Ultimate Power. And I started that also. It's a short comedy. And Kevin said, man, you got to play like that guy, you know, like quite crazy. You know, the little over, the little, little toned down because that person is a little worse than boss, like ten times worse. <laughs> but um, you know that that movie actually, I heard later that he used to uh, the Sony people because the Sony people said, "Listen, this is a supporting actor part. You know, this guy is a fighter; it's not an actor." And he said, "No, no, no, he's a good actor." And, and he showed that DVD, and that that convinced him together, of course, with the name Kevin James. And uh, it was really cool because the guy was uh, there was the money guy. He was kind of, uh, you know, he was doubting me. And the first scene of the movie for me was the singing scene with the Journey song. Yeah. That was my first scene that I had to film. And uh, after the first scene, the first take, he walked up and he goes, dude, I'm so sorry I doubted you. This is freaking awesome. Now, was that your real singing so, or did you have to actually sing kind of bad on purpose? <laughs> Oh, no, 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 I did that on purpose wrong. You know, when she goes higher, the first uh, the first part is good, but then when she goes higher, I tried to go higher with her as well, and that, of course, ruins it. But that makes it funny. Yeah, it was hilarious. You know, I knew you were a good actor at the very beginning when you were talking to Kevin James's character, Scott, and you were asking him to be your tutor, and initially Scott said he couldn't do it, you know, and you turned away and had this look on your face. And I swear I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. It rivaled any of the best acting I've ever seen. You man, you know, you moved me, man. I, I felt your pain at that moment. <laughs> I uh, really appreciate that. I had a, uh, had so many great compliments. I mean, even the great movie reviewers, if they, if they say, "Oh, the movie is such a movie," but you know, uh, Nico, he played a really good part. And another guy, I had one guy saying, "Oh, that guy was way over the top because nobody is like that." And everybody started laughing because Nico is boss. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's pretty much me, a little bit more hyper. You know, but, uh, yeah, he said, no, no, no person could be that upbeat all the time. I go, well, you should hang out with me for a day, dude. Now, now you're behind the scenes on some stuff, too. Uh, didn't you do some motion capture stuff for video uh, games? I did, yeah, but for, that was for, uh, yeah, Grand Theft Auto. I did that. Uh, Grand Theft Auto 4, all the fighting you see is me. And actually, I don't know if you ever saw it, if you really want to laugh, Go on YouTube and find Boss Roots and Grand Theft Auto 4. I have a TV show. When you go to the to the safe house, there's a TV playing, and you can switch your channels. And one of the channels is uh, in the man's room with Bob and Jeremy. And, man, that guy is a total psychopath, Boss, there. <laughs> and uh, you you really want to see that. I played that so over the, I have to send people out of the studio 
because they were messing up the scene because they were laughing so hard. I said, dude, I can't do this like six times in a row because then, the, you know, it doesn't come out real anymore. Then it looks rehearsed. It needs to be totally freaking psycho. And, and I think I really did a good job. You're going to see that. It's hilarious. When you're doing that motion capture stuff, are you beating on somebody or are you just pretending? You know what? We, we had a major breakthrough because they no, normally motion cap it's all in the air. <laughs> and I told them it's a stupid thing to do because then it looks like the punches are flying through. You have to let me hit something because you're not going to see that anyway. They only see you have these little balls on you, you know, everywhere. So they don't see the body. But then I hit, uh, I was shadow boxing in air and then I shadow boxed on uh, somebody who was holding something for me. And my, the whole studio went nuts. They go, oh, my God. Because now when you hit, you can actually see the power coming back and going into that person. And that changed the whole game. They were, like, so stoked about it. So we did everything like that. You know, outside of your role uh, with Inside MMA, do you think acting will be one of your main gigs in the future? You know, I'm really hoping. I, uh, You know, I got right away uh, William Morris. They saw the movie. They contacted my manager. We didn't have an agent yet. So that was, like, right away. We have the top dog. You know, and there was, like, these great things. But... Um, the movie did like $45 million in the box office. They said that they, they were hoping it did better because it is a really good movie. People can say what they want. You After the movie, you're going to have a good feeling. And that's what I always say. You know, If that happens, well, the movie did what it needs to do. I think it has a great message for all the kids, you know, helping each other. You know, and uh, I, 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 thought it was, I, I thought it was a fun movie. And uh, we, we thought we were going to get more work out of it. But... Um, Nothing really big happened. I, I, I did do an, uh, another movie, which comes out in, um, in April. It's a baseball movie. It's called Mercy Rule. And I'm a, I played a part of a uh, baseball coach uh, with, his, uh, with his sunflower seed spinning the whole time and a big beard I have <laughs> and uh, from a, from a uh, minor league team, little kids team. And I'm a little crazy there also. They, sometimes I'm normal and suddenly it's like, you know, so the kids... Really like that, and and apparently they did a great job because now that company wants to do another one with me. But I'm I'm not going to talk about that yet because it's far away. But if that happens, that could be really good for me. Well, let me ask you. I heard tell that you're a certified chef. Is this true? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, right? <laughs> I think it's fantastic. What is your best dish? You know what? It's uh, it's like with me and fighting. I I don't have an I, I, I you. I won with any kind of submission. I didn't do an Omo Pilata or a Gogo Pilata, and I think for the rest I pulled off every submission in the book. And with knockouts, it's the same thing. And and I have that with cooking, too. I, I just, I would like to cook, I would like to make a really good soup like a bouillon mm. and make it over three days, and then, you know, with Riesling wine and you do some, uh, some special vegetables, so you have a really good soup. And then I like, for instance, in the, the appetizer to be salmon, you know, with the... With an, uh, what's it called, the yellow sauce. I forget, a hollandaise sauce, but a real one. You make it yourself, an egg, uh, with yolks, you know, so it gets more foamy and better. Mm. And then the main course, I like filet mignon with any kind of, most of the time when I do something for the family like this, I make just three sauces, like a red wine sauce, I make a pepper sauce, and maybe a uh, gorgonzola, you know, like a, a heavy cheese sauce. But they're all based on that. Uh, brown font that I make. And that, that you also have to make yourself. You know, you can buy it, but if you make it yourself, you put it in the oven with the meat, with the, uh, what is it, tomato paste and all that stuff, and then you start mixing it with flour, and then you get your own font, your own base. That's a really, the, you, you can really tell the difference. Now, at a dessert, you know, yeah, bechamel sauce, I, I like that a lot, which is, it's, a, it's hard to make, but it's really good. It's also with yolks and with white wine, and you have to, mm. and it's like a really good foam. And you put the hot, that hot uh, sauce you put over cold ice cream, mm. and that that is really, yeah, that's one of the. I like it. I have those courses all, and uh, I had a really good night with mm. a nice wine. You're making <laughs> us hungry here. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm going to actually eat after this with the family. <laughs> so, boss, what do you got going on right now? I know you got your weekly Inside MMA show, which we just mentioned. Is there anything else on the horizon that our listeners might be interested in? Do you have your own class? Do you teach MMA or anything like that? I do. I do. You know, I always said if I have a gym, I would love to teach there also because I don't like it when my name is on the gym and I'm never there. You know, so I teach Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6. 
I'm really <clears throat> into the O2 trainer right now. It's an invention, a lung training device that I invented when I was 14. I used to be an asthma patient, a really bad asthma patient, like not able to eat, uh, not able to drink almost. I would lose uh, pounds and pounds in, in one week because I would lay in bed 24 hours like, <laughs> like breathing like this. Yeah. And um, But I also used to do trek and field. And every time I had a weak attack, I needed three more days to to recoup from that and to put some weight back on, I would resume my track and field and I would break my running times all the time. And I, I that always stuck in my head until I went to a doctor's office and I saw it uh, on the wall there was a drawing of a pair of lungs on the poster. And there I realized that the lungs are not infected, it's the lung pipe that's infected. And I go, I had that moment, that ah oh, moment. I go, oh my God, my lungs have been trying to pull air through that infected bronchiole pipe so they've been working all week long, really, really hard. So I kind of train my inspiratory system. And then when the infection is gone, it's much easier for them to breathe. So why don't I come up with something that controls the air intake? And and that was it. And that's been always in my head. And about three and a half years ago, uh, that was with Vendelay. He was on TV. He was uh, training his guys with a snorkel device. And I think I had like six or seven phone calls from all my buddies. And they said, man, you got to make it a routinizer. That was the name we had, the routinizer, the first name. Mm-hmm. And he said, because somebody's going to come up with a bus. So I started doing a pattern search. And what do you know, man? Nobody had it. Uh, because mine only controls air intake, which is better than controlling air in and out. You know, I can go into detail about that. That's going to make a, a long program then if I do that. <laughs> anyway, I, I made the O2 trainer. Listen, I've been, I've, I've been an asthma, asthma patient my whole life. I have been with me my whole life. Everywhere I go, I have an inhaler. Because if I sneeze three times, I have asthma. You know, I have to spray it open. If before a fight, I go in the dressing room, I start punching and kicking, then my lungs will close. I have to spray them open. And from that moment on, I can just fight for hours. It doesn't matter anymore. But I always need my inhaler. I have not used my inhaler now for eight or nine months. And I'm not even fighting anymore. So I was always in peak condition. But it still needed my inhaler. I didn't touch the inhaler right now. Don't even have it in the car anymore. Hey, man, so it's, uh, congratulations it's on that. Amazing, yeah, it's an amazing product. And it's, you know, I have already a uh, review from the sax player from the Eagles because you do it. I got longer, stronger notes. So it's for singers, for horn instruments players. And, of course, it's great for athletes. And, and that's, you know, when you do a product yourself, you have no clue how much work that is. And thankfully, I have a beautiful wife who works really hard on it, too. She does the most work, so to say. I'm the pretty face. <laughs> and and uh, that's it, man. It's so hard. To, you know, I mean, you have no clue how hard it is to do all the social media and the search engine optimization and keywords and paper clicks and paper. I mean, it drives you crazy. But uh, it starts picking up. And people start realizing how good it is. Well, speaking of social media and websites, you mind giving our listeners a... Uh, tell them where they can go as far as finding information about you. You know, yeah, bossreason.com, of course. And boss is spelled with one S. I always tell these people, it's not bass, it's a boss. And, um, the boss. and Facebook is <laughs> facebook.com slash bossreason. Uh, uh, bossreason MMA on Twitter. And uh, I, I do I do here and there. I do the other one also. What is it? The picture thing. The Instagram, but... You know, I think it's just Boss Rutten. I, I, thankfully, I had that name. So if you just Google Boss Rutten, sometimes, sometimes I get these people on Facebook and they ask me, like, where can I buy the O2 trainer? And I go, really? <laughs> <laughs> try to put dot .com behind it. Or try to Google O2 trainers. See what happens, you know? I go, wow. If you ask me a question, ask me a personal question. You know, I want to spend time on that. Then I'll answer him, I'll go to my website. And then you get a reply, what is your website? I go, oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, people don't Google anymore. I Google everything. You, you have no clue what I Google all the time. If I have a question, I don't like to ask other people. I always try to find out myself. I think it's uh, more fun. Well, boss, man, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm taking out uh, time of your busy schedule, man. No problem at all. And thank you guys for, uh, yeah, do it a half hour later. We make a whole bunch of family pictures. Man, this girl is awesome. She does that every two years for us. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, for the Christmas cards. We got to make the Christmas cards for the family and all of them. I hear you, man. That's just a tradition. Yes, sir. All right, man. You have a good one. Thanks a lot, man. You're very welcome. All right. Godspeed. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
25th hour radio show.